Welcome to Brain and the Bat. Um, today we have a, a rather famous, or some would say infamous guest in the form of uh, Peter Bogosian. Peter, would you like to start with a thought experiment? What do you do if you want to have a conversation with someone and they espouse a diametrically opposing view to your own, but not just a, you know, I don't know if you guys watch Star Trek, like a mere ideology, ideological view, but one that you find absolutely grotesque and repug repugnant. I'll give you one. A lot of people are talking about right now defunding the police and the role that violence ought to play in the United States uh, and the role that violence ought to play in bringing about civil change. So here's the scenario. You're having a conversation with someone who justifies and espouses violence against people for the sole purpose of uh, stopping oppression. What do you do? What do you say? How does that conversation go? So I, I once had a situation like this where I was teaching and I had a student who suggested a genocide. Um, and okay. I was quite taken aback. It was the class president. He suggested a white genocide. Um, and I, I said, okay, all right, what would your arguments for or against the position be? Hmm. And what did he say? He was unable to engage in that discussion for more than a minute or so and left the class of, of his own accord. Right. And um, there are reasons. There's a reason for that, by the way, but, but go ahead. Yeah, so, so I, I, I'm, I'm guessing what the reason would be that he wasn't able to hold that kind of ambivalence in his mind or that cognitive dissonance in his mind and weigh two positions at the same time that would, would conflict with each other. I'm guessing that was why. Well, the, is in life, there are many reasons for things, but my guess is that, that people who espouse these views, it's not just that these are discrete views on it. Like if you had a nexus of beliefs, you know, like if you look at the coherence theory of truth, you guys are philosophers, it's that they participate in a worldview. And that worldview doesn't value conversation, doesn't value debate, doesn't value dialogue. So it's, it's not surprising at all and I ended that, that thought experiment with a question, and, and that's almost always the way to go when you're in those situations, is you end with some kind of a question, usually a benign question. What, ideally, what you want to do is you want to build some kind of rapport so people look at you as a human being as opposed to you know, a white guy, heterosexual guy, or whatever nonsense it is at the time. Your exogenous characteristics, your immutable characteristics. And so then, you know, you'd want to start off something slow, like, oh, well, what, what, do, you, what do you mean by, by genocide? Oh, that's, and whatever you do, you don't want to invoke a defensive posture. So, oh, that's, that's really interesting. What do, you, what do you mean by genocide? Oh, who, who, who commits the genocide? Are there camps? Are we going to put up like a Buchenwald or a, is it going to be voluntary? <laughs> No, but it's, 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 it's just, the, it's just, it's, it, there's something remarkable about asking, not a dispassionate question, but a question calmly about what someone already believes, but not so much the conclusion, but the method, or in this case, I would be fascinated by the implementation, how that would work. So, so are you trying to, are you asking clarifying questions first? So you're very neutrally asking questions just for them to expand and explain. Yeah, and often you'll find a few things happen in these conversations. You'll find that what somebody else meant, what you thought they meant, is not actually what they thought they meant. So maybe they didn't mean, you know, genocide. Maybe them to them, genocide meant something different. I'm not saying it did, but the only way that you could know that is to ask clarifying questions. And then you want to ask people about the methods for their, their reasoning. So people love to talk about what they believe. So you're asking someone to tell you what they believe, tell you about why they believe it, and the key is to not invoke a defensive posture. The key is to get people talking. Uh, the way to avoid all of this stuff is, if, if, it, it is uh, to create any kind of adversarial relationship. So the more you can err on the side of not being confrontational or adversarial, the, the much, not only the better the conversation, but the higher the likelihood that you can instill doubt in someone's beliefs. So it seems to be the case that the kinds of conversations you can have and where they go are going to be different if they're one-on-one -on -one or if they're in some public forum like Twitter or Facebook. 100%. 1,000%. Mm. And it seems like, let's say you're talking to this person one-on-one, -on -one, uh, they might, I would think, first of all, be less likely to adopt a more radical position because there aren't people to inflame and impress um, and be probably more likely to make concessions. Um, 
And on an online platform, you kind of, I think what we have really is we think we're involved in a normal conversation, but actually what you've got is a gladiatorial arena um, with a crowd baying for blood, you know, enjoying the sort of hype of it and both sides playing up to that and not necessarily engaged in the truth seeking exercise, but often get engaged in some sort of public shaming exercise, you know, um, that's, that's 100% accurate. Yeah. And the key there is you have to invoke, uh, 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 suites of techniques from other lines of literature like hostage negotiations. Um, and a key thing in hostage negotiations is that all of this stuff is rooted in ancient Socratic values and, and techniques. And then it's just, that's a skeleton. And then you add flesh to that skeleton through cognitive behavioral therapy, cult exiting, et cetera. But the, the cult exiting stuff is really good about saving face. And in the book, Hot Am Impossible Conversations, we wrote about building golden bridges and other people have written similar things and taken from hostage negotiations. But the thing is you want to infuse all of this into a single conversation. So you don't want to be incestuous in one line of literature. You want to use the best available evidence, the most robust data that we have to figure out how to have a conversation with somebody. And an example of not saving, not letting someone save faces. Oh, you fucking retard. Took you long enough, you moron. You fucking idiot. What a tool. All of those things, not only do they invoke a defensive posture, but they make it more difficult for someone to revise their beliefs, especially when you attack them personally as a, as a, as a person. And so here's an example of a golden bridge. Yeah, man, I, I thought exactly the same thing until I found out X, Y, Z, you know, whatever it is, like whatever X, Y, and Z would be like if you were formerly a Christian or you know, Muslim, whatever it would be. Here's another example of a golden bridge. Yeah, this is a really complicated issue. I had such a difficult time with this. Boom. And then I would immediately follow with another uh, technique that's more controversial called altar casting and that you cast someone in a role uh, of the kind of person with whom you want to have a discussion. But again, all of these things uh, evolve naturally or when you get, it's like riding a bike. And in the book, we, you guys listened to or read the book, right? Yeah. So we talk about how you, it's absolutely essential to not skip ahead in the book and just go sequence. Those are bundled specifically because they're sequences that enable you either to instill doubt in someone else or help you instill doubt in your own beliefs. And if you skip ahead, it just won't work. Like you won't build a golden bridge. You won't have an opportunity because you didn't build rapport because you didn't ask questions. You know, it all builds on each other. So is your goal here to have a conversation or is there <clears throat> subsidiary goals to that? Is, is that your primary goal or how would it work? In chapter two of the book, we talk about I think the section is goals. The goal is whatever you want it to be. The goal is to try to figure out if what you believe is true. We wrote about that in chapter seven. Maybe the goal is to instill doubt in someone. Maybe the goal is just, you just want to get along with someone, your girlfriend or boyfriend's parents or whatever. And you just want to, you know, you got to survive the thanks. You guys don't have Thanksgiving over there, but you got to survive some kind of whatever the analog holiday is, you know, uh, you know what Thanksgiving is? Have you heard that before, you people? All yeah, yeah. yeah some- that's uh, <laughs> when you white Americans murder the, the natives, right? That's yeah. exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. We celebrate that, right? That, that's Yeah, that, that's, um, what we, that's, that's, that's what we get told in South Africa. Yeah, yeah that's good. That's good. That's, that's, I can see social justice ideology is, is alive and well in South Africa. Very much so. We could have different goals in conversation, as you say. Some of it might be about persuasion. Some of it might be about rapport. Um, and that the kinds of conversations you would have would be would be different on that basis um yeah. so what are the it, it strikes me at the moment that you know america is not a place where you can have civil conversations 100 percent accurate yeah that, that conversation is sort of broken down and that the value of conversation partly about being able to talk about things that are exceptionally controversial is that you can blow off steam um that you can you can understand someone without agreeing with them. You might, but you might say, "Well, you know, I, I at least I at least understand you, you know, and I don't now need to resort to something beyond speech." And what seems to be happening over the last few weeks is that speech is out the window, um, and that you now have public acts of violence, um, and that it is impossible to talk in this environment. Yeah, it's not just the last few weeks. This has been years in the making, and it's been years in the making by our university system, which has propelled this forward as a value. And not only 
has proponents, but taught people about this. You know, they, they haven't modeled civil discourse. They haven't modeled conversation. In fact, they've modeled just just the opposite. The lines of literature. I don't know how much you want to get into it, but Ju Judith Butler's talks about parodic disruption. You know, do you want to disrupt events? And my events were disrupted, and that's a virtue dis disrupt events. And again, as we started with the conversation, violence is now a virtue. And do you guys do you guys do jujitsu? No, I have a friend who does jujitsu. I will tell you in no uncertain terms, when somebody is on top of you, they don't have to be on top of you, but when someone's on top of you and they're choking you out or they're um, trying to crack your arm, it is fucking terrifying. I mean, it is, it, and, and the, the thing that prevents it, the thing that prevents it from being terrifying is that you know that you have a way out. Even if you just tap, even, sometimes like the, yesterday I was doing jujitsu, I just tap someone just like this. Um, because sometimes your body is so mangled by their weight, you can't do anything. But there is something, there's something about that process that changes a person. There's something about, very few people can, can get good at that because it takes a lot of humility and it, and it takes a lot of saying, I quit, I give up, I submit, I tap. And I think people would be well served by understanding what it means to be in a position and there's no tapping. It's horrifying. I mean, you, 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 you can't breathe. You, you want to, it's just like the George Floyd thing. I mean, it is a horrifying thing. And to advocate that this is a new norm in society, that we don't allow people to tap out. That is a kind of ignorance of which people, it's, it's horrific. Mm. And by tapping out, you mean tapping out in the conversation by saying, oh, whoops, I made a mistake. No, I mean, I mean, tapping out, like physically tapping out. Like we have people, violence. I see. Yeah, actual violence. You know, we have people running around with just totally deranged ideas about abolishing the police. And yes, it does mean abolish the police, not just defund the police. And if another fucking person tells me that these people don't actually want to abolish the police, it's a metaphor for something. I mean, I'm going to go live on a fucking ranch in the middle of nowhere. No, <laughs> they want to abolish the police. You know, it's funny. It's really interesting. It's like when I did a lot of the atheism stuff, people would come up to me, you know, secular liberals would come up and be like, they don't really believe in talking to snake. No, 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 they don't. They don't really, that's just a metaphor. They, they don't really. And I remember once I had a, I was having a conversation with a guy, uh, one of my, my colleagues is no longer at the university. And there was a, 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 a guy. So he came up, we were out in front of a university where I teach and he gave me that line. They don't really believe in talking snakes. And I turned to this guy and I said, his name, I said, do you believe in talking snake? Do you believe in an actual snake that talked X thousands of years ago? He goes, yep, absolutely. 100%. And I said, there you go. He believes in talking snake. What do you say to that? The guy didn't know what to say. You know, you have people running around who want to actually abolish the police. That's the most fucking ludicrous idea that I think I've ever heard. What do you think? <laughs> is we already know what's going to happen. I've been putting out on Twitter repeatedly. You know, the murder rates are going to go up. Murder rates are going to go up. Murder rates are going to go up. And no one's going to be honest about the cause. And we're in a, a crisis of legitimacy, our institutions, our judiciary, our our president's a fucking another lunatic. You know, we, we, we have a crisis of confidence in the Southern Poverty Law Center, traditional groups that used to identify hate speech and hate groups, the ACLU. The New York Times is a co complete catastrophe right now, all over the, all throughout the political spectrum. And it's, you know, we can't have these conversations because nonsense is being pumped up by the universities. So, you know, what, what do we do? I, I think my speculation is that's one of the reasons why, why people like Joe Rogan are so popular, because he keeps it real and he just... It's a place where p people want that. They, they hunger for discourse. They hunger for dialogue. They hunger to express themselves without being, being mobbed. And we can't do that. And the consequence of that is now we are, our, ours is an empire, not only in decline, but in crisis. I mean, it's interesting that you identify universities as the source of the problem because, yes. you know, traditionally universities were the place for having difficult conversations. You know, if you think about Oxford Debating Club, you know, you would have people, you know, arguing in favor of slavery on the one hand and people, you know, arguing for abolition on the other. And it was this place where you could sort of clash ideas, incredibly controversial ideas. Um, you know, the point of that is to try and 
re-understand, I mean, I think, you know, any person with a decent moral compass is going to acknowledge that slavery is completely abhorrent, but being reminded of why is quite useful. Being able to have the conversation is useful. And what we've done, as you say, is we stop the conversation and that's, you have academics calling for it to be stopped. So, you know, um, you know, someone like Milo Yiannopoulos, you know, could, could have a talk and the university would be thrust into, into flames uh, because his presence is a violence. And that's the other thing that strikes me as an interesting pose adopted by these guys, which is they'll say, well, the language that you've used is violence or your skin is a violence, your presence is violence. And because of that, because they've changed the meaning of this word, Yes. They, they can then say, well, we need to meet violence with violence. We fight fire with fire. You know, so when we, um, you know, burn down stores and kill people, uh, you know, that's all justifiable. It's, uh, you know, it's given what you've done to us. Yeah. Okay. So we got a lot of stuff you just said. We got to unpack that. So the first thing we have to do is that, that this masquerades, they have all these fancy terms and words. Do you, have you heard the word inclusion? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So an inclusive space, I'm sure you've heard that. And so what an include, I just gave a talk in London about this about six months ago. I don't think the video is up yet, but what an inclusive space is. So think, so f follow me on this. I'm going to talk about this and I'm going to talk about how the university has made, has um, enfeebled people to use a Dungeons and Dragons word, uh, enfeebled people so that they have not only brittle epistemologies, but they've kind of, made a virtue of having a brittle epistemology. So an inclusive space is one in which people feel, now, okay, so stop me at any point in this, I'm gonna give you like a syllogistically. An inclusive space is one in which people feel welcome, right? Because if people didn't feel welcome, it wouldn't be inclusive. So by definition, an inclusive space is a welcoming space, right? Right. Okay, good, we all agree. So, uh, so in order to feel welcome, you can't say things that make people feel uncomfortable or unwelcome. What's an example of something that makes people feel unwelcome? Well, it, that's, well, it could be literally, literally be anything. I mean, you literally could find somebody who's offended by literally anything, including belching, which I just had a thing with. Okay. So, well, just your presence, right? Just your yeah, presence. Yeah, your, your presence. Like, that's what I said. Like, literally anything. You know, you, oh, a dude speaking English. Oh, that's a, that's a, um, appropriation. He's wearing clothes. It's appropriation. Oh, he's, you know, using toilet papers. Every fucking thing is an appropriate. The whole society, every little thing, you, you be, everything is an appropriation. <laughs> Eyeglasses are an appropriation. So you're that's appropriating. That's it. I'm taking these off. I don't want to be culturally <laughs> appropriating anything. <laughs> you're appropriating. Um, <laughs> Here we have a we have a case when, when when you talk about inclusion, what inclusion really means is restricted speech. So inclusive spaces have to restrict speech. That's what it means. Because if it doesn't restrict speech, some people will feel unwelcome. Now the universities have gone bananas with. I mean, this is what it looks like to live through a moral panic. We are living through a moral panic, but it's not just an ordinary moral panic it's one in which it's the one in which they're they're promoting and they're promoting it through well equity is another term we we may may want to discuss but all of these things are barriers to conversation now let's get into the brutal epistemology if the like the the person with whom you're arguing uh jason we, when he talked about um genocide the if you create an inclusive space long enough i can guarantee you people will never hear the other side of an argument in academia now they may hear it on a podcast you know we may talk about it they may but they won't hear it in academia and then it, it that's particularly true if you have an enforcement mechanism a bias response team an office of diversity equity and inclusion so somebody can be found guilty kicked out of the university you know steal their time black, whatever, you know, whatever, undergo, you know, training. I've been told so many times I need sensitivity training. Um, imagine that. Who the fuck are these? You need sensitivity training. Oh, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so on, on this front, I mean, one of the things that you're very famous for is the, the grievance studies hoax. Um, yeah. and, and part of it was, you know, I gather aimed at, you know, the stuff that's been going on on campuses, the kinds of things that um, people are willing to publish. Um, and it's, 
I mean, my, my favorite one of those was um, where you, you had a recommendation for how to redress uh, the injustice of the past in the classroom, um, which if I remember correctly oh. was to stick the black kids at the back of the room and the white males at the front um, in chains. Yeah, um, light, light a, change on the floor, no, yeah. no seat. We call that a form of experimental reparation. So we got busted by the Wall Street Journal before, which is an uh, age me like a president, unbelievably stressful time. Um, so I think seven of those were published or scheduled to be published. Seven more were in the hopper uh, about, you know, uh, in some some chain there, some some like chain. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think that one got published if memory serves me correctly. Yeah, maybe the comments you got from a review was something like, um, "We like it, we just don't think it goes far enough." That's the thing. Yeah. That okay. So about. so that was the problem. Okay. So the problem with that one was, I told and I was wrong. I told Jim, I'm like, dude, this nobody, this is so fucking crazy. Nobody is gonna take this, even by their own standards. This is insane. So I put in this thing by Amanda Rector called uh, something like, um, I can't remember, like being compassionate, like the importance of being compassionate. So I, I argued in that paper, oh, you know, we need to be compassionate when we put people in chains. And the reviewers just lambasted me for it. They're like, no, we shouldn't be compassionate to these white people in chains. What are you talking about? And I, I mean, it was like such a mind blow to me. Like, oh my God, like, holy shit. They don't even want you to be compassionate when you put people in chains. Like these, this is the type of, no, th these people have tenure. They have jobs for life. They're teaching our kids. They're molding society. This is the dominant moral orthodoxy. And these people are like, I don't know, the grand wizards of the fucking diversity board. I mean, they're operating all of these these, I mean, the whole thing is a catastrophe. So I am now at the conclusion that I think it would be a wonderful thing if academia, and I realize that, that what I'm about to say may seem, ostensibly may seem in sound, but I think that it has to be defunded. I think it has to fall. Um, I realize that would, would uh, top tier one schools will be fine. I, I do realize and I fully acknowledge that will jeopardize our competitiveness in the world, economically, particularly with regard to China. I acknowledge all that. But if we do not stop this, it might even be too late now, to be honest with you. I, I feel, felt a little despair, quite a lot of despair. It might ap actually be too late because the damage is done. We've created a whole generation of people that think it's a virtue to be ignorant of the past. Um, uh, and, and I don't mean, like, I'll give you a quick example. Um, I, I usually keep my family out of this, but I'll give you an example. My, my uh, son graduated from high school. He learned nothing. Total waste of his time, local public school here. He knows everything about the Black Panthers and Black Lives and colonialism. But once you leave that, he knows nothing. Um, these are indoctrination mills, and they funnel them to the university, which is indoctrination mill. The people in, in – Lyle Asher has some wonderful stuff about this. He's a professor, Lewis and Clark. Uh, the colleges of education have been taken over by ideologues, and part of the nonsense in which they indoctrinate people that, you know, to this, this intersectionality, the moral orthodoxy, part of it is that you, know, you, don't, you don't platform people. You don't talk to racists. You don't talk to Nazis. You don't talk to – Daryl Davis is the outstanding example of, of somebody – um, um, who has done just that and his methods have been proven effective, but we, we have a, a complete legitimation crisis on our hands. I'm deeply concerned. In fact, to just today, I, I bought SDAO, which shorts the market and it, I think the market was down five, 500 points, which I looked, you know, I bought gun stocks, Smith and Wesson at 10 and it was 18 today. And I just, for a couple of months, it's just beaten them. It's dominating the market. I'm completely convinced that what we're seeing here is a, a, a change that it is, appears to be thoughtful and under the guise of lowercase s, lowercase j, social justice, but, um, but it's, it's pushing us to the pre preface of lawlessness. Um, um, I mean, the whole thing is a, it's a complete clusterfuck. The whole thing is a catastrophe. It all started in the universities, and I'm still waiting for all those people who told me, nah, this is just a small group of lunatics in humanities departments. They'll never seep out. I'm waiting for an apology. So I've got a question about that, Peter. So when you talk about how to have conversations with people, I'm assuming that most of the time those are everyday Joes, or, or everyday social justice warriors, but they're people on the street, people who hold this view, but are not necessarily academics who espouse this view. 
I wonder whether the same techniques could be used with an academic. Um, they won't. So I, I would urge you, sorry to cut you off. I would urge you to go to my Twitter feed and uh, see I, a, a woman, I'm not going to mention her name because I don't want people to be dogpiled, but if, pe but if people want to seek, seek that out, they're more than welcome to do that. You know, she said, oh, I'd like James Lindsay to try that on me. I'm like, all right, great. Let's have a conversation between you two, knowing full well that she didn't. So I invite her a conversation. She's like, yeah, I'll get back to you this weekend. And of course it was, she's not going to get back. I mean, every Andrew Doyle is a friend of mine, pumped in. I was like, dude, she's not going to get back. Of course she's not going to get back. And then I just tweeted again. But again, I don't want her to get harassed. But again, I think that the key is there's no, this is so important. There's no apologia in what they have. There's no defense like a First Peter 3.15, defense of the faith. There's no built-in robust mechanism for defending any of these ideas. This is the problem, as you say. Is, I mean, your methodology is one of openness, reasonableness, patience, tolerance, and you're confronted with an adversary that denies all of that, uh, that instead seeks, you know, lots of attention to kind of pile on with, with public shame, to use force. You know, if I think about, you know, the important thing about your grievance studies hoax was to try and say, there's a problem here. There's something that we need to consider that the university seem to be okay with publishing content that is, you know, made up of jargon. I mean, you, you're copying and pasting stuff from the postmodern essay generator, retranslating Hitler's Mein Kampf and getting it published, right? And falsifying data. I think the thing you guys got caught on was the uh, dog parks create rape culture and that you personally inspected 2,000 dog genitals. But I mean, you got it through, right? And the point is that- 10,000. 10,000, excellent. <laughs> um, and, and, what's, and, I, and I think it's, a, it's an incredibly virtuous thing that you did, right? Because you're, you're integrity testing a system that most people save and scrimp for their whole lives so they can send their kids to university because they think this is a trusted institution. My kid is going to you know, go here. They're going to you know, you know, feast upon the treasures of the world's knowledge, become an active citizen, do these wonderful things. And instead, as you say, they're exposed to, to lots of garbage. Um, that these, these kind of papers that are coming out of big humanities journals aren't even read by anyone. They're not even like cited by anyone. It's this sort of, you know, publishing mill of garbage. And really when you expose that, it should be celebrated. And the response that you got from I, what I gather from your university was Fucking not Nazis. <laughs> right. Yeah. It was to yeah, say, right. we're going to exercise so, power on you. We're going to okay. punish you. So think, think about this. I give you two, two examples. Think about you. I don't know if you guys fly. I used to fly a lot. Think about this. Imagine if somebody snuck a bomb, a fake bomb, or maybe even a real bomb through a bomb detector at an airport and then went over to the guy, you know how they have the, I don't know how it is over there. I've never been to South Africa, but they have these like stations in America. And they're like, hey man, I just snuck a bomb through there. It'd be a really good idea if you kind of fix that system so no one else makes a bomb there. Imagine if the person said to you instead of, holy shit, thanks, I can't believe you got, imagine if they said, you fucking Nazi! Can you imagine that? This is a right-wing conspiracy. How dare you? Or think about this. I said this on, on John Stossel show. Think about this. Imagine if you, I'm sure you, you, I know nothing about South Africa, but my guess is you guys have bridges over there. Imagine if you tried to, to uh, uh, sneak papers into engineering journals that said that the, you know, we need to start constructing bridges out of balsa wood. And you gave some lunatic argument for that and people are like, yeah, man, this is a great idea. And then they started constructing these bridges and then people drive over the bridges and die. I guarantee you, everybody in society would be like, wow, man, thank you so much for, for pen testing, penetration testing that system. Thank you so much. But instead, you're met with anger, rage. <clears throat> it's because they've placed an ideology before the truth. And the, and the, and the sad thing is that and I'm just so, you know, like the kind of leftism I love is Helen Pluck Pluckrose's leftism or kind of liberalism. The, I'm so disheartened by the response on the left to not take a look in the mirror, even though I personally agree with treating people with dignity, gay rights, gay marriage, gay adoption of children, all of this stuff, like I'm 100% there, but that doesn't give you license to make shit up.
It just doesn't. And the consequence of that, if you don't use robust methodologies, the consequence of that is that people won't trust you. You are contributing to a legitimation crisis. And we see that every, we, and look at us now. Look at the society now. Look at it. Part of the problem, as I say, is you've got this asymmetric war. So on the one hand, you have the kind of reasonable approach, the demand for evidence, um, you know, a sort of sense of, you know, being charitable of your opponents, trying to understand them in the best possible light. And on the other hand, you have people that use very powerful rhetoric, you know, that are going to rely on, on big symbols um, to kind of get their stuff done. And, and they're successful at it, right? So, and if you look at, um, you know, what's, what's happened in the States, you have, um, you know, not only academics getting on board with a radical movement, but you find big corporations doing the same. Um, and they're not persuaded by evidence and reason, they're persuaded by sentiment um, and that they feel like there's something in the air that they need to respond to. Um, and that makes it very hard. You know, the philosophers sort of put in this awkward position where you want to say, can we just calm things down a few notches and, and let's talk this out? And the other person says, you know, I have no time for your dialogue. There's a revolution happening. Yeah, and there's an infrastructure... I think I told you before the program started, uh, Aubrey Lord's, the, the, you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. Reason is the master's tools. Science is the master's tools, scientific method. Now you see it, particularly in South Africa, this idea of de decolonizing the curricula. You want to throw yourself back to the Stone Ages? Great job. Decolonize the curricula. So imagine research justice is another deranged idea that these, these maniacs have come up with. And this idea is that you only want to, you either only cite people with certain identity markers or something that has an identity level salience, like, you know, they're trans or they're, you know, black or, you know, whatever, whatever is some kind of oppression variable. And then you don't cite, <clears throat> excuse me, or you, you, you cite far less frequently white people. Well, you should cite something because it either falsifies the claim that someone's trying to make or because it buttresses a claim but it's based upon the most robust research and the best available evidence. Whether or not someone is white or Jewish or a midget, th these things are completely irrelevant to whether or not they should be cited. And this idea that you have speech utterances that are tied to immutable characteristics and you can't know the truth. You know, I'm a big fan of the correspondence theory of truth myself. This idea is an anathema to civil democratic societies to representative democracies to the to the scientific enterprise as a whole the, the and 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 we have a very significant number of people taking this upon themselves as a moral virtue that's the other reason i think that the whole enterprise needs to be rethought and dismantled all of it all of it 100 percent is an it is an indoctrination mill where low-grade intellectuals use their positions often positions to, for life uh, to uh, indoctrinate people, not to show them, a, no, there's no intellectual diversity. They've called intellectual diversity. So I'm convinced at this point, the only sane thing that we can do to save what, whatever possibility we have left of civilization is to defund the universities. Yeah, it's, I think there's, there's a lot to be said for that view. Um, you know, if the university has stopped being what it used to be, which is a sort of place where you can freely inquire, and we must yes. ask, what is its purpose? Um, and it seems that in a lot of ways, universities have become this um, kind of playground for the rich, where you don't go to university to get an education. You go there to make connections, have access to a wonderful football stadium, um, you know, and imbibe, as you say, a kind of ideological framework, um, a, a correct think, um, and then, you know, go out with it. And, and that really seems anathema to the goals of university. What, what I've been doing for the last couple of years is because I, I love philosophy um, is picking academics uh, who have themselves been vilified um, on campuses and having private discussions with them um, among, you know, intelligent, like-minded people. And we can disagree with each other quite fiercely in a, you know, in a philosophy room. And it sort of feels like you're in a, a master's level seminar uh, and doing this kind of thing where we can freely engage with, um, with academics and try and further, you know, our, our knowledge. But it's not clear to me that, you know, the traditional spaces for that um, are the right spaces anymore. You know, as you say, universities aren't, aren't living up to their, their goals. It's clear to me that they're not the right spaces anymore. It's clear to me that, you know, you said, what, what is it? Think about Plato's 
the book seven of the Republic, it's, it's not to put something in, it's to pull people out of a certain state, a state of ignorance, right? It's, it's to help people reflect. And when you said before, it's, <clears throat> this has been resonant lingering in my, the back of my mind. The, the other value that I hold is belief revision. You know, no, no, I don't want to be wrong. You know, the Theotetus Plato talks about, or Socrates, if any, how you look at it, talks about, you know, people unknowingly do or believe bad things. I, I don't want to be wrong one more second than I have to be. Um, but yet we've created a system to entrench people in their beliefs. We've created a system. I mean, the whole obsession, I don't really want to get into this because it's a whole nother discussion, another podcast, but the the takeover of the Black Lives Matter movement and the fact that our universities are now advocating political positions where they should be neutral. The, one of the consequences of this is this lends to the erosion of trust in our public institutions. It's again, it's the delegitimation crisis that Habermas talks about. We simply cannot have public institutions advocating particular, particular can't, as much as I despise Trump, I think he's a fucking lunatic. We simply cannot have our public institutions. They must remain remain neutral to, to ideologies. But now there's been an ideological takeover of our institutions and, and they've systemically purged and called divergent voices. And they've done so ironically in the name of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we, we have a problem that can no longer be fixed. There's no corrective mechanism. There's no ability for people to reinforce. Now, COVID may have expedited some of this, the demise of the university, but it can't come too soon. And what do you think these people are going to do who's pushing, you know, gender nonsense? You know, I mean, you can look, I mean, this is, these, these are not complicated issues. I know they might seem complicated. The trans bathroom, the trans people in sports. I mean, we could linger on that if you want. I mean, these are not, these are fairly easy issues to think about. But if you have people hell bent on, you know, imagine if you went in, you're a philosophy guy. Imagine if you went into a class, uh, an ethics class, right? knowing that you had the right answers to moral questions, testing people on that and getting responses, grading them on how their views um, correspond or um, align with the moral views that you hold. That's an anathema to the last 2,400 years of Western intellectual thought. But yet these lunatics have picked this up as a badge of honor. And by the way, just parenthetically, you can push back. You can disagree. You know, you can give me shit. Do whatever you want to do. I'm 54. I'm almost 54. I, honestly, at this point, I mean, just go for it, man. <laughs> so, so, Peter, I'd like to push back on, <clears throat> I think it would be a very interesting and possible conversation. Um, please, please. So, I happen to believe that you should uh, abolish the police, although for very different reasons for... Uh, uh, very different reasons um, compared with those offered by social justice warriors. So I thought it would be very interesting to have that conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. I, I will say that the, um, I will be very upfront about the difficulty is I cannot speak to a South African context. So I, I, uh, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, that's fine. Uh, we can, we can make it a kind of a neutral context. I don't mind okay. setting it in America, although my knowledge about America is very weak, but we can try. Um, okay. All right. Let's do yeah, it. So yeah. you, you, so you think the police should be abolished? Yes. What do you mean by abolished? How do you define abolished? So I don't want there to be a state owned police service or a state driven police service. Um, I, that doesn't mean I don't want any form of security or any form of, of law enforcement per se, but I just don't want it to be done by a state driven system. Who, who would do it? So I, I can imagine there being private security forces um, that are hired by individuals, uh, which is really the way it happens in South Africa. So we do have a police force, but they're so inept that all law enforcement generally tends to happen um, through, through the guise of, of private security um, anyway. Are they, and you, again, you have to excuse me, I know nothing about South Africa law enforcement, literally nothing. Are they, is there some kind of a, regulatory apparatus that that is responsible for regulating private security is, i mean how does that work well there is a legal system um and officially there is a police force so if if a, a security officer were to behave in an illegal way i guess he could be arrested by a, a police officer i think in addition to that there might be some kind of governing ethics slash slash rule system that governs the way um, 
um, security officers operate, but I wouldn't want that. Um, so in the world that I want, I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want some kind of governing system. What world, what world would you want? I'm an anarchist. So I want a, I want a, gov- a state free system. I don't want an overarching state looking down and checking up on people. Where do you vacation? <laughs> well, at the moment, nowhere because, because of COVID. But, um, but oh. in general, um, where do I vacation? Well, there's lovely spots around South Africa and I have been to Europe frequently. Um, oh. yeah, have you ever been to the Congo? I, <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> I, haven't <laughs> I haven't been to the Congo. Oh, why not? Have you been to Syria? <laughs> <laughs> Mark's having a great time because Mark happens to be a lawyer. So he's very much in favor of a, a legal system. But, but let, let's run with your idea. So, so, so why do you ask whether I've been to the Congo? Well, you know why. Well, what, what you're implying is that we would land up with a system like that, right? We'd land up with well, chaos. I'm a, I'm a, so, so you're a philosopher. So that's um, Habermas's critique of Derrida, that there's some kind of maybe not a performative contradiction, but there's some kind of a contradiction in if you actually believe that, like if you truly believe that, then why don't you go to Syria, the Congo or Iraq? Or, I mean, why, why do you vacation in places that, that have strong police forces, police presences? Well, it seems to me like those aren't good examples of anarchist systems. Um, If you look at, I beg to differ, (laughs) I beg to differ. Well, they're anarchic in one sense, right? So if you, if you, it's, it's, there's a, there's a great injustice to the word anarchy, which is that it has two meanings. Uh, mm-hmm. And the one meaning is just a neutral meaning, which is that there's no state, but the other meaning is that there's chaos. Um, so, so, you know, you can move from the one meaning to the other and you're absolutely right. There's chaos in those countries. Um, but, but there is also a very strong state often in those countries. It's often a totalitarian state. Um, so that state is implementing very ironclad rule, um, and, and, you know, oppressing people in, not in the social justice sense, but, but in very, uh, illegitimate senses, you know, in, in very scary senses. Um, so, so. The kind of system that I think would be more interesting is, um, you know, I visited Spain at one point um, and Spain, they couldn't form a coalition government for over a year um, because no, you know, the parliamentarians couldn't agree. Um, and, and so what happened was that Spain basically just carried on as it was before they were able to form, um, you know, when they were able to form a coalition government and once they could no longer do so, um, it just carried on with those same laws and then eventually kind of deregulated and deregulated or decentralized to the point where, you know, individual municipalities were doing their own thing and it was running very nicely. And I did visit Spain and it was lovely. Um, and, and in the strictest sense, it was an anarchist, uh, it was an anarchist state. So you, you just so that I, I want to make sure that I, I understand here. So you want to do away with the police force and you want to substitute that with private security. Yes. Have you ever read, he, he's really out of vogue right now, but have you ever read Charles Murray's What It Means to Be a Libertarian? No. Well, he, it's a wonderful little book. I highly recommend it. He, uh, Ch- Charles Murray is on the shit list now because he, there's a chapter in The Bell Curve where he talks about racial differences in IQ. And actually, ha- Oh, Harris, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. Sam Harris had him on his podcast. But yes, he, yes, yes, yes. He sets up a really interesting thought experiment that I would be willing to do with you uh, to, to literally create a whole society out of it. So, and you, you tell me what you think of this and if this matches your idea as I understand it. So he proposes a dual system that you can keep the existing structure, for example, in uh, health, the health departments and businesses can just opt out of that. But if you opt out of that, you get something on your window uh, of your business or the internet would have, you know, have opted out of the, in this country, it's the FDA, whatever your analog in your country is. I, we have, op- this business has opted out of food inspection and food safety, et cetera, et cetera. And people are free to go there if, if they want. And then you can, you, you can keep the existing regulatory structure, but you can give people, it's kind of a more, I don't want to say anarchist, but I would say libertarian framework. I guess my question for you is, would something like that work for you? Like you could set up an area in which 
uh, certain communities would simply have no police and then they could do private security. I can already hear the voice in the back of my head from, from the left saying, well, that, that's going to screw over poor people. But bracket that. that um, yeah, yeah. Those aren't my concerns, right? So yeah, my concerns are oh, social oh, that's justice. Per perfect. Yeah. That makes the conversation much easier. W would you be willing to engage a kind of society like that where you got to, to, to ch make that choice for yourself? I mean, I, I, I can hear him being led down the garden path to a brick wall. But, uh, but yeah, let's go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm in. Okay. Okay, well, cool. Well, uh, you know, so at this point in the conversation, you could do a lot of things. And, and you know, I don't know, you've read the book, so you probably, you probably uh, saw a lot of the things that I did within that, in that brief conversation. But usually at this point, this would be a really good point to just stop and agree. Like, yeah, I, cause I actually would want to see that too. I actually would love to see yeah. because then you'd have a control group and you could make comparisons and then yeah, yeah, could, yeah. You know, over a certain period of time, you, you can yeah. look and see what the outcome is. Okay. So, 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 so actually you didn't lead me down a garden path to a brick wall. What you did instead was you, you created actual agreement. Yeah. Because in that case, uh, the, the goal was not necessarily to, to instill doubt. You know, there are many, you, you can also have conflicting goals in your, your head, you know, rapport, agreement, uh, you know, building coalitions and just basically trying to figure out what's true about the whole thing. I mean, I really wouldn't. I, I mean, if I didn't think that was an interesting solution, I would have stopped. But again, nagging in the back of my mind was, geez, well, what about poor people who are stuck in the police? And then one could say, not necessarily for moral reasons of that, too. One could say, well, that's not an actual that's not a fair control group because you can't look at the results at the end because people didn't have the ability to freely choose. They were limited by economic conditions. Um, yeah, but, and there yeah, are so solutions that would be to that problem as well. There are other solutions. Yeah, and that's, um, yeah, and that, and that's fine. And, but that would be an example of how you can have one of those conversations where you can end right, up right. out an agreement right, without right. any feeling doubt or what have you. So what yeah, I find so how to diffuse an anarchist lunatic in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you give in to him, right? That's what you do. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, what I found very interesting about that conversation was that um, it's quite different from the kind of conversations that philosophers would have. Um, if, you, if you put two philosophers together, what they will usually do is ask the other side to elucidate their position. They'll even still man it, right? They'll help them get the best version, but only so that they can knock it down, not with a goal of winning, but with a goal of providing the very best objection so that their opponent can provide a really good response, which surprises them and they learn something from it and together they reach further for truth. But something that I've experienced personally, and I think Mark and I have both experienced, is that when we do this with non-philosophers, the response is not, oh, wow, you've come up with such a cool objection to my view. I'm so impressed. Thank you so much. I've learned so much. It's fuck you, right? It's like, right. How, right. Like, how could you think that, you idiot? You know? and, and that's right. very that's hard. Right. And then it, it kills the conversation. So I think this, this methodology is, is a very interesting alternative when it comes to dealing with non-philosophers. But that's what I was asking earlier. What do you do with academics? What would you do with a philosopher? How would you, would you deal with them in the same way? Like how, how, would, how would you engage differently? Yeah, it depends on your goal. And in the book, we, we have a whole section on that called synthesis, which is exactly what you just described. The, the key is that to, to do synthesis, the, there is a caveat though. People have to be willing to revise their beliefs, both parties. It's, it's very difficult to have a, a conversation of synthesis because people that whole thing I mentioned before is, you know, saving face or winning or, you know, maybe they, maybe, you know, like it's like when you're, you're teaching a class, there are tons of reasons that people ask questions, you know, maybe they want you to know that they know or how smart they are. Or maybe there's some hot chick down there and be like, Ooh, you know, maybe I'll get a date with her or him or whatever. If I ask a good question, I mean, you know, th there are a lot of reasons for our speech utterances and they aren't necessarily to find the truth. So, you, you can expose that fairly easily, although intention there is always hard to discern through a basic Alinkus, you know, kind of the third stage Socratic method. It's not, uh, not overly difficult, but what you do largely depends on your goal and the quality of the, of the com you know, the, I don't want to say the quality of the person, but the, 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 um, the uh, intellectual integrity of the person with whom you're having the conversation. So, are there things where you have changed your mind quite radically on a position due yes. to conversation? 
Oh, due to conversation. Um, boy, I'd have to think about that. I, I have had a, um, again, I think this is where our cultures differ, but there's something in this country called the Second Amendment, and it's basically a right to bear arms. I, I have had a radical 180 turn of, uh, in, the, in the last few months on that. I went from never owning a gun, being against guns, being against anybody else owning a gun, to co collecting a virtual arsenal at my house. Um, so I've had, a, I've had a change of mind on that. I think th that's the larger shift. I've had a lot of micro changes of mind or smaller changes of mind as a result of conversations. I've, I've, um, I, I think the key is that I'm not really invested in many of the things I believe. Some I, I'm not. Um, I think it's tricky to answer the question because I don't really have conversations with people since the pandemic. I'm just locked in my house and think about what stain I should use for my fence. Um, and, and I'm writing my book. So I, I'm, the question is stale to me because I'm not in living conversations and I haven't been in for, I don't know, since March 6th, I think, 7th. Why did you change your mind about the guns? Uh, something my buddy John said to me. Um, I, I think um, it, it's, it, it, and it wasn't like it was a slow evolution that I had a single argument that persuaded me. Um, but I remember when the pandemic broke out, I was so nervous to get my first gun. My friend John said, if somebody comes, a guy to jujitsu with John Merlich, Merlich, said, if someone comes into your house and they have a gun and you don't, it's over for you. I think I changed my mind because I saw how people were reacting to a crisis and I don't have confidence in our citizenry. I don't have confidence. And not only do I not have confidence in the police to protect me, I don't even have confidence in the police to protect the police. Right. I don't. And that's the other reason the impetus for buying gun stock in which it went from 10, 10 to 18 or 19 in, in a very short period of time. Uh, I, I changed my mind about that because it, those things only work when the um, basic fundamental principles of a society are sound. But I changed my mind because, uh, you know, I went from writing all the time, et cetera, to all I want to do is like grow my own vegetables and shoot guns now. Oh, and, and pick market stocks. I've shorted the market and I'm expecting <laughs> a precipitous market decline. So we'll see what happens there. I've, I've gambled my, my, um, my retirement on it. So that should be interesting. There's a famous episode of Planet Money where they, they decide to short the markets. Um, and the purpose of it is to show how strong the American market would be. Um, <laughs> now might be the right time to have made that bet. Yeah. So this is really what I think is really important. I don't think it's so much about um, shorting the market or not shorting the market. I think it's about making, you know, you're, you're so smart. You think you're so smart. Okay, great. Make a prediction. Make a prediction. You're so smart, make a prediction. So I, I, I've tried to move and I'm very hesitant to do some of the stock stuff and other things. I don't want people to take my word for it because it's way out of my area of expertise. But, but what I, I think it's really important to be held publicly accountable for your thoughts and ideas. And when you make predictions, there's a way, there's a mechanism to adjudicate that, you know, like you can show it to be false and not predictions like, oh, you know, we should love everybody, you know, quantifiable discrete metrics about which we can predict. And I think that's really important as it, cause it also keeps your delusions in check when it's on Twitter or when it's public. So that's one of my concerns with the extreme left um, is that very little of it is falsifiable. Yes. Very little of it we can actually, we can say, okay, this is the prediction. It's happening on this day. We can check. Oh, it didn't happen. Oh, there's a problem with the theory. I mean, how many theories about, you know, how many critical race theories, how many gender theories are falsifiable? No, no, no. They're all ideology. You know, I was in, when you said that, I was, uh, a, my sarcastic self was going to Kathy Newman you. You know who Kathy Newman is in that favorite George? I was going to say, so what you're really saying is, and then say <laughs> that you're saying something you weren't saying at all. Uh, so, 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 you know, so what you're really saying is that all of these gender theories are falsifiable and we already know they're true. And you're like, well, no, I <laughs> wasn't saying that. What you're really saying is that there's an overarching patriarchy and, you know, <laughs> metaphysics. I, I want to point people to a resource at this stage in our conversation that I think they'll find incredibly helpful. James Lindsay is the CEO and he's a, my, one of my best friends. He's uh, uh, did the grievance studies with me and, He's the co-author of How to Have Impossible Conversations. And for the first time ever, I'm going to reveal we're doing another book together um, that we just started. But uh, I'd like to recommend new discourses to everybody. 
And it's just a fantastic, uh, it, it is a wellspring of information. But even if you don't want to read articles and you, know, you just like memes and stuff, go to the, it's called like the Encyclopedia for Wokish, a Wokish Encyclopedia or something. He takes ordinary words, like the ones we've talked about here, racism, equity, social justice, inclusion, intersectionality, diversity, uh, et cetera, a white fragility. And not only does he give their definitions from their literature, like he traces in their literature, he is Neo from the Matrix with this shit. Not only does he trace it in their literature, he also gives a very brief um, commentary on it. It's one of the most useful resources because often people talk past each other. You know, you're talking about diversity. A friend of mine was, t was telling me a story that sh she was, um, I'm going to make sure I tell this story in a way that this person cannot be identified. She was walking down a street and there was a construction crew. Uh, and we live in Portland and Portland is all white. Um, of, of, of everybody was African-American. And she said that's, her, she told me her friend said to her, that's incredible. That's the most diverse construction crew I've ever seen. <laughs> so so we, we have changed the meaning of words. It's not like, you know, neologisms where people, you know, smash words together, or whatever. We, and, and when you change the meaning of words and Webster's is now changing the meaning of racism, it makes it very difficult to have a conversation with someone because you're not talking about the same thing. You know, there were all these years ago at, at the institution where I teach, I try not to mention their name anymore, but um, there are all these, you know, panels about diversity and, and the importance of diversity. And I said years ago, like, why, why don't you have somebody who's, who doesn't hold the same political ideology? Why don't, I can't remember, I think it was before the age of Trump, but, you know, why don't you have some Trump supporter or something on the panel? It, it's because they don't mean by diversity, they mean only superficial identity markers, like, you know, skin color or someone's in a wheelchair or something. They don't mean intellectual adversity or somebody who approaches the problem with a different kind of uh, methodology even if it's a methodology i don't agree with you know some dude's been praying in the desert for 15 days or whatever and you know or he's a christian or i mean i'm certainly not religious to say the least but you know we need to encourage these sorts of um diverse environments but it's not what the <clears throat> intellectual diversity uh, diversity means intellectual homogeneity among people who look different. But anyway, New Discourses is a great research resource that people can can look, and it helps them. I think it might even be called Translations from the Wokish. It helps people understand when you have conversations that what you think you're having a conversation about, you're not having a conversation about. You're having a they're having something in your their head, and you're having it in your head, and never the 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 twain shall meet. Well, the danger in that, of course, is not just that people talk past each other, but it's the fallacy of ambiguity that happens. So, right. so it, it, it happened early in our conversation when we used the word chaos or when we right. used the word anarchy is that right. the word then has two meanings and then right. the person in the conversation can trade off between the two. So let's right. take the word diversity, for example, right? So they can say, well, of course, diversity is a good thing, right? And the original meaning for diversity, well, it does seem like a good thing. But the right. new meaning, it's not clear at all. So they right. take the original valence associated with the first term or the first meaning and then plonk it onto the new meaning. Right. That's the Mott and the Bailey. That's what it is. It's just, ah. it's, a, it's a common strategy. Yeah. Did you spend a lot of time with people in prisons um, and that you kind of use the Socratic method um, with prisoners um, and that uh, you sort of found this a useful uh, mechanism for reform? Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? And I went into Columbia River Correctional Institution, which is a, a local prison here in Portland, Oregon. And I used the Socratic method to look at questions from the history of Western intellectual thought in an attempt to increase prison inmates' critical thinking and moral reasoning abilities to help them desist from crime, particularly predatory or violent crime. And then that was, um, <clears throat> you know, obviously like any PhD year, your dissertation committee reviews it, et cetera, et cetera. It was an incredibly rewarding experience for me. And we did a follow-up <clears throat> and the follow-up was like, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, should this class have been longer or, and, and I'm, I'm a big, I'm also a big fan in, in, in terms of low costs or no cost interventions for things. Cause you know, 80% of the, of the men at the time that was an all male correctional facility are re-released into the community and consistently on ballot measures, less so in, in, in Portland, but people don't want to spend money on prison, prison reform, but yet the pe prisoners get out, offenders get out and they 
they go back into the community. Did you find that the, that the method was, was useful for reform measures, that, that those prisoners then came out and were less likely to commit crimes? Yeah, I, I, well, based upon their self-reports, it was indispensable. I actually ran into a couple of them subsequent to that years later, and uh, it was a very intense experience, man. They, one of these guys, I ran into him in Seaside, Oregon. He owned a shop. Uh, which is on the coast over here. He was just like crying. He was, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, giving people those tools to have access to, to think. And the key there is I used to think almost obsessively about corrective mechanisms and a corrective mechanism is a way to, to align your cognitions with reality, to, to correct falsehoods. It's kind of like it, it's in the book. The largest section of the book is defeasibility. <clears throat> it's kind of falsifi falsifiability applied to moral ideas. The Olympus is the best way we know of. I, I, my own personal belief, we can quibble with this or take issue with this if you want, is it's the best way, not that we know of. It's the best way, period. It's like the scientific method. It's just the best way to know things about empirical phenomena. I believe that the, the, the Olympus is the best way. But, but anyway, I think, I think that idea of, of defalsifiability, you know, how, how could your belief be wrong? Um, if the conversation had, had continued with Jason about anarchy and the police, I would have done two things. I would have asked him to put his belief on a scale of one to 10 with one being, you know, I, you know, this is definitely wrong. Five being maybe 10 being a positive. And then I would have just started, started immediately on the disconfirmation questions. Well, what evidence could you be provided with it? And then you can do tricks with scale uh, tricks. Then you can do things with scales, but the key is to provide people with a, corrective mechanism that they can impose upon themselves. And I think the feasibility is the best way to do that. Can I just ask a clarification question? You talked about the Olympus. Yeah. Can you, can you just uh, tell us what that is? Yeah. Um, so the Socratic method, people broadly consider that it has a bunch of stages, you know, stage one begins in wonder, you know, like in the Republic, you know, I wonder, you know, what is justice or, you know, in the Euthyphro, uh, you know, what is piety or, you know, whatever. And then somebody pr provides second stages. They, they provide a, an, an answer to that. You know, oh, justice is um, first three books of the Republic. Justice is pay paying your debts. And then uh, stage three is counterexample. So basically it's the Olympus. It's a, you ever seen law, you ever seen the show, the old show law and order? Yeah. I love law and order. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, like those, those, I haven't seen this show in like 20 years, but there was a really good, those were good examples of the Olympus. So basically, um, the detectives, you know, it goes from the patrolman, I don't know how it is in South Africa, but then they have detectives and detectives like, you know, they, they look into the murder, they, they try to figure it out, who did this, and then they bring it to this guy who's the captain of the precinct or the lieutenant, right? And they're like, this is what we got. And then that, that's a great example of the, of, of the Olympus, the lieutenant's like, what about this? Well, I'm not sure about this. So it's a rigorous examination. It's looking at, you know, trying to falsify, trying to say it's not evidence. And if he says, okay, you're good to go, that's like the next stage of the Socratic method, which is re re revise your belief. And that would be like, it would go to a jury. So he's like, yeah, we now have enough evidence to convict. And so our level of confidence is high that this will be adjudicated in our favor. And then the fifth stage isn't really the Socratic method, but you know, I think it is, a lot of people think it is. Ideally, it would be act accordingly. You know, there are things like the Greeks have acrasia, which is lack of you know, a will or what have you that would prevent one from doing that. So you can bracket the fifth stage, but I, I think the fifth stage is legitimate. Anyway, that's, that's the, the, the Alinkus, that third stage of the method. Excellent. Um, well, Peter, I want to thank you very much for uh, a wonderful conversation. Um, it wasn't oh. impossible at all. Uh, it was uh, filled <laughs> with all sorts of uh, uh, joys and emotion and, uh, and reason as well. Um, and um, we, we'd love to hear more about, uh, about your new book. Um, so we should definitely uh, have this conversation again sometime soon. Cool. Well, I'm, we may have to go in hiding after it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> then you know you've done it right. If that's Indeed. not the best endorsement for a book ever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what does Chris, Christopher Hitchens say? The grave will leave plenty of time for silence. Um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're really seeing a, um, all kidding aside, a, a very serious problem in which the rudiments of Western civilization and 
people talk about freedom all the time or privilege all the time. I'll tell you a privilege, freedom privilege, privilege of being born in a society in which you can criticize, in which you can protest, freedom to, to voice your expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press. Those are privileges and those are privileges that we ought to value and yet we're seeing our academic institutions undermine those those basic privileges and and rights every day and it's a catastrophe it's a civilization wide catastrophe i sincerely hope that i can make some kind of a of a contribution to to stave off that decline and maybe even push us towards valuing the right things yeah, and you know, and you must be commended for that because you know now is a, a time when it's become difficult to be brave, um, and it's the few brave voices that are able to kind of guide us towards a more just, reasonable society. And it's not always easy. And you know, um, speaking the truth in this sort of time will be seen as uh, you know an, an act of treason. Um, I appreciate that. That that means a lot to me. And the Greeks have a virtue, a, a word parahesia, which means speaking truth in the face of danger. I think it's a it's an obligation for us. You know, the, the line that between civilization and barbarism is very thin. And now is the time that if you want to take action or if you want to speak up, it's a time of fear. It's a time of cancel culture. It's a time of mobbing people for mistakes that they've made in the past. There's no redemption narrative. There's no forgiveness. There's just, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a frightening time. So um, anyway, I appreciate the conversation and the fact that, um, the fact that you guys talked to me. So thanks.